Book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3. I was thinking last night as I was sitting watching people, which I do quite a bit, and I watch people when they are married, not married, Mary, M-E-R-R-Y, and I watch them when they get drunk. I watch them when they're sober. I watch them. I, just, I like to go to a mall and while well, Kathy's doing some shopping set and watch people. And, uh, I like to go to Daytona and watch people get crazy, whatever. But uh, I was telling Harold and Mr. Friday last night, I, I did my dues years ago, and I don't know whether you call them dues or not, but I don't have any desire to feel bad. I feel bad enough when I get up in the morning anyway. I'm not going to induce it, but... Uh, I have no judgment against that, and and that's the one thing that bothers me is that the judgment all your life you were folded, mutilated, and stapled to think that that is such a terrible sin. <clears throat> Folks, if you can't drink, don't. If you can't handle it, don't do it. But don't get somebody and nail them because they do, because you got no control over them. You're not their judge. Uh, you can't change the world. That's just quite obvious. And uh, there's a lot of things about people's problems that are written in the book. And, you know, the Ten Commandments are exactly what you and I want to do. That's what the flesh does. It, that, uh, God knows He made us. And He gave Israel those Ten Commandments knowing that that would be what their flesh would do. And He said, sustain from this. And uh, uh, do you know what there is no commandment on Hold on there and go to Deuteronomy chapter 5. I didn't say that. <laughs> this is about the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy 5 is, of course, the Ten Commandments, as is Exodus 20. Verse 7, He said, Thou shalt have none other gods before me. Is that the number one commandment? Looks like it, don't it? Verse 8, the second one, Thou shalt not make, in, the, uh, make thee any graven images or any likeness of the thing, of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. There was no graven images. That's the second one. Third one, verse 11, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. America's had on that. Quite obvious. Fourth one, verse 12, keep the Sabbath. How many of you do that? Most people around you don't even know when the Sabbath is. Okay? Verse uh, 13 says, Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. You know, people think about the Sabbath day as as a worship day. No, it's a rest day. And you could not travel. I doubt Harold could travel. Probably it'd be rough on a horse to get here. Was it uh forty miles maybe? Thirty something miles? Forty something miles from your house? That's a horse journey, ain't it? Yeah, well, he said you're not supposed to travel just a certain amount on the Sabbath day. Furthermore, he can't cook. He can't do anything like it to that. And yet, you know, we got the fast cars. We can go 500 miles in one day. Now, look at verse 16. Honor thy father and thy mother. How about America on that? Verse 17. Thou shalt not kill. Verse 18. Neither shall thou commit adultery. Do you know what adultery includes? Married again. If a woman's put away, if she marries another, she commits adultery. That would hurt, wouldn't it? Verse 19, the eighth one. Neither shall thou steal. <coughs> Taxes. Verse 
Verse 20, ninth commandment, Neither shalt thou bear false witness against thy neighbor. Telephone. Right? 10, verse 21, Neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife. That television is full of that. It's just absolutely crammed back with that. Now, that's 10 of them. Right? What's missing? Drinking and dancing. There's a church that built its organization on the fact that if you dance, you commit a sin. Look for me in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I'm just going to be ornery today, okay? Or should I say ornery or er? Okay, that'd be good. Ecclesiastes 3 1. Of course, the birds made this a popular song in the 60s, and the, the hippies thought it was great and didn't know it was biblical. Ecclesiastes 3 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up. A time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance. <coughs> <coughs> Did I read that right? <laughs> a time to cast away stones plowing. Uh, it's not good to plow when you got stones, so you cast them away. And a time to gather stones. It's time to build. You need a foundation. You need a fireplace. You need something. You need a foundation stone. So I'm mean, telling you all this is going on. A time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing. Uh, the Bible says, how can two walk together except they agree? I don't embrace somebody in their doctrine that is not correct according to the book. Uh, there's no need of that. People say, well, you're not a very friendly lad, are you? I said, it has nothing to do with friendly. Of course I'm friendly. I love all you. I love the people in the world that would trust the Lord. But I am not going to embrace bad doctrine. I'm not going to embrace it. And he said there's a time to embrace There's time to, to not embrace or whatever. All right? A time to get, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to cast away, a time to rent, a time to sow, a time to keep silent. My wife, I threw a pair of britches away, and then I found them the other day. And the trouble is, the pocket had a little rip in it. And she said, I cannot fix them because they will rent more. So I went out of work, and I realized what she said. I was bending over picking up some metal over there, cleaning up some of and I heard this go whoop, and I felt a draft. And I realized that there was a time when it went. <laughs> so it says a time to rent, a time to sow, a time to keep silent, a time to speak. A lot of people don't understand that. There are certain times you ought to be quiet, and there's times you shouldn't be. A time to love, a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he hath labored? I have seen the travail, and that is Romans chapter 8, verse 22, if you want to read it. He said, The whole creation groaneth and travails in pain together. All right? What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he hath labored? I see the travail which God had given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. The things that we learn on this earth are to point us towards a God that gave us time. Folks, we had no right to even be on this earth as far as our choosing. We didn't choose this. But there is some beauty in this world. Absolute incredible things that I've seen in my lifetime. And there's things that I would love to see in America alone, in this United States. I don't have to go across the big pond. There's, there's things in the United States I'd love to see that I haven't had a chance to. But... There is beauty in what God created. I, I mean, the finger of God as it worked in His statements to be. What He created for man to look at is amazing, folks. I mean, you ever been to the uh, Death Valley or uh, uh, the Grand Canyon? I mean, you ever been to Niagara Falls? You do not believe there's that much water in this world. When I was a little boy, I stood in awe of the horseshoe, and they had told me that men went over that in a barrel. And I said, there are some stupid people in this world. <laughs> they go over that in a barrel. I don't think they let them do that anymore. We got in the ship down below and had on a 
slicker and whatever, and we're just soaked and wet from the mist of that water hitting. And you look at that and you say, where is all this water coming from? I mean, when does it stop? And it never stops. It just keeps coming. And the rotation of the freezing and whatever, and contrary to global warming, whatever, that our educated individuals have. Verse 11. He has made everything what? In his time. Also he set the world in their hearts so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. You have to read about it, folks. You can't understand it at all. I know that there is no good in them but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. I also And also that every man should eat and... Oh my gosh! Dancing and drinking! Now I never said that about drunkenness. It said eating and drinking. Folks, you know what? A certain amount of alcohol never makes you drunk. But if you don't know how to control it, quit. Why, that's excess. He said, uh, drink a little wine, but he says, not in drunkenness, which is we're in excess of drunkenness. But, you know, folks, people have problems in this world. Do you know that? Do you know why people drink? To forget it. That's exactly right. Now, why would I stand in judgment of a man? I ain't been in his shoes. I might be looking at a man that is drinking that just lost his family. Proverbs 31 is about that. But drunkenness just on a regular basis, folks, that's idiotic. That, that is someone that's doing something that they think they can get away with, I guess you might say. I, I thought about something. Uh, if a person, when he gets saved, he sees things in a different way, doesn't he? How many of you, when you got saved, begin to look at the world differently? Did you realize that you weren't concerned about global warming or whether uh, Greenpeace made it or Sierra Club or whether you, what you ate, it didn't matter. And, um, you, you learned that no matter what, God made it all and He's got it in control whether we like it or not. You look at it there. You look at the fact that salvation belongs to God, not you. But you, you look at things and you say, I'm at peace with God. And you see, you were raised, and I was thinking about this, last night, people come in and they grab a bottle, they grab a, 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 something to drink, and if the people they had taught, been going to and been taught right, they wouldn't need that to think they're doing something cool. Drinking is not for coolness. Drinking's for Mary. The folks, it's all about that, but yet people take it to an excess because their flesh says, I'm getting away with something. And what's amazing is, I'm sitting in there with them, and I'm the preacher, and they all know it, and they don't have any problem walking up in front of me because they've heard me talk about the liberty in the Lord. But when they sober up, they go to the church, and they sure wouldn't get in front of that pastor with a bottle of beer. Are you listening to what I'm trying to explain to you? Maybe I'm not getting it over to you. Say, well, they don't respect you. I don't think it has anything to do with respect. I'm not judging them. Judgment is what people do to other people, and in that judgment of what they're doing, they might, they might well be judged themselves. Say, so you're, you're telling my kids to go out and drink. No, sir. I'm not telling them to go out and do anything. I'm telling them there was a man knew what they would do. And He died for them. Jesus Christ died knowing what you and I are. Folks, if, if He knew we would get good enough, He don't need to die. That's the issue. I don't want my kids getting drunk. I don't want my kids taking a chance of getting in a car wreck. I don't want my kids taking a chance of going to jail. I don't want my kids acting like idiots. But they do you know why? Because they're sinners. But what I want my children to do is be saved. 
Because there is a time of death. Let's look on. He said, verse 13. And I always thought it was rather unique. The 13, the number of rebellion. 13, the number of Gentiles in the sense of their rebellion. He said, also that in every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is what? I hear that. God gave it. You know, if God didn't want certain things, He would have stopped it. Gentiles will eat anything they want to eat them, and if they'll eat them, if they can kill it, then they'll eat it. The Jews were set down, and He said, I want you to have a dietary law. Can you tell me why? Why He gave them a dietary law? Now, how do you stay on earth? You have to be alive, don't you? So, wouldn't it be to their benefit to abstain from what we eat? What we eat will kill us, right? So their dietary law was to let them, because of what was their inheritance? The earth. And so the dietary law was given to them because then they would their their life would be lengthened out and, and so forth and so on. The Ten Commandments were given to them so that they could live with each other on the earth. Are you with me? If you keep the Ten Commandments, won't your neighbors be a lot better off? There's nothing wrong with the the law is spiritual, folks. We're carnal. The law is spiritual. It's good. There ain't nothing wrong with trying to keep the commandments as much as possible. That way you will do your neighbor right and you will be doing God right. But that will not get you a heavenly inheritance. That is an earthly inheritance law. Okay? Now, they failed, didn't they? You remember what Deuteronomy 6.25 said, If you do all these ordinances and these commandments, it shall be your righteousness and to your good. Well, what did they do? They failed. And the biggest failure of it all is they killed. They murdered somebody. Didn't they? And God forgave them. That's mercy, isn't it? That means you would forgive somebody for killing your son. Well, if Harold got a call from, from uh, Auburn and somebody had killed one of his sons, what do you think would be in Harold's mind? Go find him. If I had to kill one of my daughters, I'm going for him. Say we go to jail. Probably. That don't lie in me. He said to live peacefully with all men as much as lie in you. I'm a very peaceful man now. I have the peace of the Lord that passes all understanding. And I'm at peace with God as far as our salvation. You know, some things ought not be done. But I'd think about it probably. Then I'd ask myself, what did the Lord do for this individual? Folks, God Almighty looked down from heaven and saw people that denied His Son that created the heaven and the earth. Did Jesus Christ, by the Word, create the heaven and earth? When He came on the earth, what did they do to Him? They killed Him. And God took that murder and applied it, the action and the vessel of it, to our salvation. Well, that is mercy, folks. That is some kindness there that's incredible. Now, look in verse 15. Uh, 14. Ecclesiastes 3.14 I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Amen. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it, that man should. Can you tell me what happens? What's fear, the, the fear of the Lord, the beginning of? Wisdom. 
Verse 15, That which had been is now, and that which is to be hath already been. Uh, probably no new thing under the sun then, huh? How many of you ever thought you did something and nobody ever did and then you saw him do it? You just knew that God's going to get you because nobody ever committed that kind of thing before. You just thought it up. And then you found out that other people have been doing it all along. Okay? Moreover, I said, I saw under the sun the place of judgment. And folks, from here down, it's going to get rough. Here down, it's going to get tough. I thought about, I was watching a couple of music, uh, movies the other day. Uh, I like Cheyenne with Clint, East, uh, Clint Walker. And the guy's horse went lame on him. And instead of walking the horse out, he just shot him. I mean, he just shot him. <laughs> I got, and I thought, as Ecclesiastes says, that's, uh, maybe when we get lame, we may just shoot people. He <laughs> come here limping, they just shoot him like a horse. Say, oh my God, no, he's a man. Well, wait a minute, let's read this. Verse 17, and no offense, Billy. You're bigger than I am. Verse 17. I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, and there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. I said in my heart concerning the estate of the sons of men, that God might manifest them and that they might see that they themselves are... I doubt man wrote this book about himself, do you? He says, For that which befalleth the sons of men, befalleth what? Beasts. Even one thing befalleth them, as the one dies, so dieth the other. Yea, they all they have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. The Lord applied thought of about a man versus an ox and an ass. And he said an ox and an ass know their owner, because they feed them. I imagine when feeling goes out, or Harold goes out and feeds their cows, and Mr. Friday used to and all everybody that had cows, they knew you. Some, some farmers will honk or have different calls, and the, and the cows will come across the field to it ready to feed. They got enough sense to know where their food comes from. Right? What about a man? I mean, men get down on their knees and thank God every day that they breathe in His air and breathe in His, eat His food. Most men don't even think about it. They're so vain. Alright, now watch. Verse 20. All go into one place and all are of the dust and all turn to the dust again. Verse 21 is the difference. He says, Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? Man don't see that. Peter does not see that. There's more emphasis on keeping animals well than humans. If you shoot your horse today, you go to jail. Right? Somebody catch you doing that, it's like, oh, he shot the horse. Shoot your dog. Oh my God, shot the dog. Take that dog down, you shoot it, don't you? Don't get killed, and you take it to the vet and spend five million dollars trying to get it well. Where's the spirit going? Did I lose you? Where's the spirit of the animal going? Where's the spirit of man going? Father, into thy hands I come in by spirit. Did the spirit of the Lord go down or up? It went up. Went back to the Father. Okay. Verse 22, Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better, oh man, this what hurts religion, that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion. For who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? How many of you have walked in misery this week? Instead of rejoicing. I'm guilty of that. I get in moods. The moon gets me. My wife knows when it's a full moon, she better stay away. It's just, I get moody. How I many of you walked in rejoicing of your own portion that God gave you and the work that He allowed you to do and, 
And uh, I thought about Donnie. He's out there in the barn at the Russells, and he's fixing up rooms and everything to kind of live in, dwell in, in which that barn is a beautiful place. If you've never been out to the Russells, you've never seen their barn. The boys built the barn, and Brother Russell, many years ago, many years ago, wasn't it, Donnie? And they built it, and, and there's been a lot of things going on in that barn. But now Donnie's got a little section there. He's making into a living quarters and everything for guests and whatever. And I thought about the purpose of that barn. A barn's used for hay and feeding and storing of, uh, you know, uh, machinery and whatever else. But it's been a lot of things. Mr. Russell had a cook, uh, I mean, uh, a sewing room in there. And Mr. Russell's got a tool place and whatever. But now it's, it's also doing something else. Multi-purpose, whatever. It's a lovely place. Well, Donnie can step back and when he gets done, he can look at it and say, Hey, this is great. I mean, you step back from what you've done this week, and my wife is a prime example. She comes out of her cave. She, I call it a cave. She'll come out of there, and she's made a dress. Now, that's not real interesting to me. I'm not into smocking and sewing. But she brings it out, and she's got the biggest smile. I mean, you know Kathy's smile and laugh. And she's just jumping up and down. She said, look at this. I said, that's wonderful. That, that's great. And, and if I really put a smile on it, she's happy. I said, that's great. But if I say what I use, I was like, yeah, that's great, whatever. Uh, you know. But I come back and I take something that's working out here. Machinery, you know. You know, man. Man, think machinery. You know. It's not a dress. And I come in, look what I did. And she said, Yeah. <laughs> We're all different, but what should we rejoice in? How many of you have ever cursed what you were fixing? Did you really want it to be cursed? <laughs> Isn't that a terrible thing? You're just beating your head in to get it fixed and get it working and you curse it. And can't understand why it won't work. Hmm. Well, it could be the curse. I don't know, but whatever. Now, look what I mean Ephesians chapter 5 with Ecclesiastes in mind. My wife is a joy. She can bring happiness into a room and I can take it out. Uh, Mark ran in that today or this week with Robin. She thought she was being mistreated and she, he paid for it. And I got to blame for it. Whatever. Ephesians chapter 5, look with me in verse 7. You've got to read the first six verses to get the context, but I want to read verse 7. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Is the world unhappy right now? Well, don't be. You're not going to change it. And the Messiah is not going to change it either. you uh, you got to live in it until the Lord sees fit to call you out. Verse 8, for you were sometimes darkness. Here's the joy. You were. The word were is a joyful word. Were. Put it up here. Were. All said and done in that past tense. Something done. Over with. Kapui. Gone. Okay? For you were sometimes darkness, but now you're the light and the Lord walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Uh, probably looks strange that our table over there and amongst the beer bottles and all that were water glasses. I was not not drinking to make a point, folks. I can't handle drinking, so I don't drink. I am like my daddy. If you put a six pack in front of me, it's gone. If you put a 12-pack, it's going to be gone. I'm going to drink it all. So I don't. I don't judge you if you drink. I'm not trying to make a point to that. I don't drink you, Dick. I'm making a point to myself. I don't need to. Because I'm happy with what I have. How many of you ever that did drink, stayed sober one night, and seen what an ass you make of yourself? That's what I don't need anymore. I, 
I'm old enough now, I've got a little bit more sense. Not much, but i got a little more sense. I know, I don't need that. But folks, that's my responsibility. My responsibility is on me, not you. I hate self-righteousness. When people look and say, Oh, look at people, man! I'm going to just mouth up. Leave it alone. And instead, in the righteousness of the Lord, tell them, Did you know that that has no effect on what Christ did for you? You see, you were raised in a system that says that separates you from God. No, it don't. Food and meat does not associate the kingdom of God. What you eat and what you drink, what you don't eat and what you don't drink has no effect on the kingdom of God whatsoever. The kingdom of God is not this earthly kingdom. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom, and the only way you can get into a spiritual kingdom is to be dead and raised. That's why the gospel said he died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day, and Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. How many realize that even though you're saved, the great temptations are always there? I heard people say God took them away. They got there with God and I got. God didn't take that away. He left you like you thought that you could present the truth in a vessel that He cleansed. There's a difference between a man washing dishes and a woman washing dishes. A woman's pretty good about getting them clean. Man, he... <laughs> or rinse them, you know. Yeah, that's pretty good. Got them out, man, whatever. When I got married, my wife noticed all my clothes were kind of pink. I forgot to separate them. And so the whites became colored a little bit. Because I just throw them in the washer. Well, I mean, she separates them and does all that. i never done nothing like that. I just throw them in there. I mean, you're going to wash clothes, ain't she? Color's supposed to be already sealed, ain't it? No. And I didn't care whether it's hot or cold water. Well, boy, that makes a difference, too. A woman has a different way about her. A saved man has a different mind about him. Does he or does he not? Do you think the world's going to be saved? Do you think that the world is going to get better? Well, you know it's going to be better in nine, isn't it? No. One man can't do that. Now watch. He said in verse 8, Where you were sometimes darkness, but now you're the light of the Lord, walk as children of light. How, Lord? Well, the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. What if the Spirit wasn't there? And if I'm not mistaken, that's a capitalist, isn't it? What if that capitalist spirit wasn't there? Wouldn't Romans 3, 10, 11, and 12 be true? There's none righteous? No, not one. There's none to understand. There's none that seeketh after God. There's none that doeth good. How many? No, not one. So the spirit has to be there, and the spirit being there has fruit. The Lord came up to a tree and He saw it up there and He went planned to eat on it. Got there, there wasn't no fruit, boy. I mean, He put it on it. Like they come by, that tree was good. Down it went. No fruit. Okay? Man that don't have the Spirit of the Lord in him has no fruit. You understand? No fruit. Now, the God of this world knows that if you don't have the Spirit, then every bit of your fruit is unrighteousness. So he develops a system where you think you're doing right for God. Folks, there's no fruit in you condemning a man that's drinking when you're unrighteous in yourself. That's judgment. Now watch. Verse 12. For it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Why do men do it in secret? 
a shame. Don't want to get caught. Feel like they're getting away with it. Me and cuss in front of me and then find out I'm a preacher. And they say, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I say, God heard you already. Verse 13, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he say, Awake thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as unwise, but as wise. Now verse 16, redeeming the time. And of course, Ecclesiastes, were we given a time, a time to be born and a time to die? Then in between there's our life, isn't it? Okay? In our life, can we redeem time? Now obviously, in time past, according to the doctrine of the Lord, we couldn't redeem the time godly-wise because we had no God and no Christ. But now in Christ Jesus, according to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 13, we can redeem the time to where that time could be profitable by the fruit of the Spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying to you, folks? Before, I thought I was doing right when I cut my ponytail and quit drinking and cleaned up my act and wouldn't do any foul words or anything and I wouldn't uh, hardly even date a woman. and I might as well become a priest, I guess. And I thought that was my service to God. The only problem is there was no fruit there. You can't perform righteousness without something that is righteous. You can't perform it, folks. You can't present something to God if it ain't there. Was God very particular about the tabernacle in the Old Testament? What if they had built it wrong? Well, how did they know how to build it? Have you ever read the text on the tabernacle and, and thought, how in the world did they figure all this out? The men that built certain things had certain skills that God called. Are you listening, folks? God not only saved you, oh yes, you deserved it, right? No. God saved you because of His Son, but He also knew what you were able to do with His help. God never gave you a job that you couldn't do when He gives you the measure of spirit and of grace to do it. You ever think about that and say well, I don't think I can do that. Well, pray the Lord, maybe you shouldn't. But then there are certain things you say, I can do that with the help of the Lord. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. So God might have a purpose. Well, of course He's got a purpose. And He's got a work for you to do. Of course He has a work for you to do. But He's not going to leave you alone. He's going to give you a measure. Something that will help you do that. <clears throat> so... What should you do with the time? What was it? Redeem it. Redeeming the time. Well, why should you redeem the time in verse 16? Because the days are evil. And boy, are they evil. I, I, I thought back in 1980, one of the first times I came to camp, how much more easy it was to talk about about the Lord than it is now. At that time, they were not the only one person in the United States that was really against God was Madeline Murray O'Hare. And it wasn't the government, and it wasn't a lot. She was just the one raising stink. But now it's just everywhere, man. Just oh, don't speak about God, and don't pray. And, um, you know, when people sue you if you try to witness them, they say you're you're infringing your belief on me. Whatever. Back when I was younger, people wanted to hear something about the Bible. They didn't have VCRs. They didn't have all the electronic gear to play with. The kids weren't in their computers playing. And you could go to a, a, a 
camp meeting or you could go to a tent revival, people would go there and they'd sit and listen and talk. And if you actually had somebody do what they were talking about, like Brother Moore and preaching in a tent, people would get saved. Because they didn't come. They didn't have a whole lot else to do. But now you invite somebody going, I've, I've got this to do. I've got this to do. I've got to do that. Uh, I've got something else to go. But on Sunday, they go to church. They go to church, and they get lamb blasted if they're a sinner. If you don't quit that, God's going to get you. It's be a pretty empty building, wouldn't it? You don't turn from that, God's going to get you just as sure as you're sitting there. It always amazed me that some of the most reprobate, sinful individuals in the world live upwards to a hundred years, and righteous, so-called righteous people die. And they say, "Well, God got him because he's out of the will of God." Well, he's the one that's supposed to be righteous. He read, we read in Ecclesiastes. Does it happen to all, even the beasts? Yes. Now read on, verse. Um, 10, proving that what is acceptable unto the Lord, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Back in verse 14, Wherefore he say, Awake thou that sleepeth and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be not unwise, but understanding what is the will, what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine where it is what? What's drunkenness? Excess. Did it say be not drunk with wine or God will get you? But uh, the local Costabo mat or that tree or that other car or the possible the worst things in the world could ever happen to you would be be drunk and kill somebody. That would be terribly awful, folks. That's why they make cabs. But they don't need cabs if they don't get excess anyway. Folks, you go out and have a drink and be merry. Enjoy yourself. Sip. Whatever it takes. But if you can't handle it, don't do it. It's excess. Nothing like putting your body through the excess of misery. When you got to take pure oxygen to clear up the hangover... That's excess. That's bad. There ain't no doubt about it. But you know what? What God didn't say and say, what did He not say in verse 18? That He's going to get you for it? You'll get yourself! Folks, there are things you can do freely, but it hurts. I mean, you like to hurt yourself. I mean, you go out every day and take a hammer and just beat on your fingers just for fun. Well, then, there is knowledge that can be attained from, from hurt, from pain, and things like that. But what does the end of verse 18 say? How many drinks have you taken versus reading Scripture? Did I miss you? Now, how do you get filled with the Spirit? The Word of God. In your past, how many... I mean, I think about that, the absolute mercy of God in consideration of when I actually started getting drunk and then when I quit, how little I even knew about the Bible. And yet now... I have more spirit of the Lord in me than I've got the spirit of booze. And I'm happier. Yea or nay? And I remember. Nothing like a two at ten and a ten at two. Nothing like, how did I park my car that away? Or, where is my car? <laughs> or, who are you? <laughs> and, why do I feel so bad? Folks, it's knowledge. It's the ability to say, how much am I 
filling with the Spirit versus how much is Joe Blow over there at the bar filling me up with? 19. Speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart. To who? I don't hear many drunks singing, Praise me to God! <laughs> so there is a difference in excess. Giving thanks always for all things unto God. I've been an iron horse many a time a day told I ain't never seen one of them guys tipping a beer. Thank you, Lord, for getting me drunk. Say, so what are you doing in iron horse? I ain't for going to iron horse. Don't bother me a bit. And I witness people in there sometimes when I get a chance. I don't care. Why? Say, hey, God will get you for that. Well, he'd have got me going to the iron horse. He knew where I was going. Folks, I go in there and watch them burn out. I can go in there and I watch how absolutely stupid they get. I'm not their judge. But if somebody walks up to me and gives me a chance, I say, did you know that Jesus Christ knew what you were doing and died for you? You see, most people that go on Iron Horse don't usually go and try to find out about the Lord. Maybe somebody's there to let them know. You never know. How many of you walk in your daily life and just can't wait to hopefully get a hold of somebody and tell them and show them what Jesus Christ did for them? Or is it in your plan to be over here and do this or be over there and do that and get this organized and get this straight and never redeeming the time? I think about kids. I try to talk my daughter into staying all night with me every once in a while. I said, you know, other kids leave home and they come back and stay all night. Well, why can't you? I said, one day I won't be here. I said, me and your mama aren't always going to be here. I love it when my kids eat with me on Sunday. Because one day I won't be here. I can get killed on any trip I make. Cars run into me. I could die today. And I won't be here. So not only can you redeem the time spiritually, you can redeem the time enjoyment. People get mad at their parents and won't have anything to do with them. Are they insane? Most likely. Are the parents mad at their children? Are they insane? Most likely. Redeem the time. Enjoy it. For it is of God that you have it. The things that God gives you, enjoy. You don't have to make it into a sinful thing. You make it into a pleasurable thing in the fact that God gave it to you. So redeem it. You get a chance to have fellowship, redeem it. You get a chance to see things that you might not have seen. People say, oh, I've got to save my money for this and I've got to save my money. Just keep stalking away and die! And then some tax man gets it. I'm not telling you, go out and blow all your money when you can't pay your bills. Pay your bills, that's all I'm all right. But have a little enjoyment in life. I love it because of Friday's going cruises. Why not? I think you're healthier for it. J.B. and Charles are Probably the elders in here with Mr. Waters and they're still walking around for a lot of people in wheelchairs. They probably hadn't had a stroke his day life. But he thanked God that he had a stroke that he saw the Lord. Robert could be bitter. But he said he comes in here and studies. Rejoice. Redeem. Rejoice in what the Lord gives you. For He had mercy on you. If you're lost in here, trust Him. He redeemed His Son for your sins and forgiveness and justification. He redeemed you in Him. Trust Him. God knows what He's doing. And God knows what He's doing every day with you. If you let Him, there's more peace. If you fight it, there's more chastisement. But thank God that He does chasten you because if you don't get chastened, you're a bastard. You're not His son. Do you understand what I'm saying, folks? I hope I'm getting it over to you. The Bible says in verse 20, 
giving thanks what? For all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he may present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord the church. For we are the members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And that's a joyment. That's a rejoicing right there, folks. You get away from your mother-in-law. No, I'm sorry. Verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Folks, those are not cruel. Those are admonition of the Lord who knew what he did. You see, he made Adam, then he made Eve. He didn't make Adam for Eve, he made Eve for Adam. You get it out of order, and there's not happiness there. Because in Proverbs it says, let not the woman have power over you. Now, why would God say that? Because He meant it. There are certain things that can be done by men that women can't do, and there are certain things that women can do that men can't do. Keep it in order, and it will be known. Nothing more I love than my wife. I love my wife more than my children, but I love my children. But my wife gave me my children. And I love all of them. And they blame me. It's the way of life. I hope I did something for you today. Hope you understand.